Okay, chapter 12, part one. I'm going to split chapter 12 um, into two parts. So this first part's only going to be about 26 slides. I'm going to tell you the story about Gregor Mendel. We're going to talk about Punnett squares and some of the ratios that he saw. And then I'm going to give you a Mendel, um, Gregor Mendel kind of packet. And it's very lengthy and it's going to be mostly review, hopefully, from Biology 10. Um, so you'll get the rest of the class period to work on that. Herman Norcross, it is on Google Classroom. You'll get your packet tomorrow. You can pull it up onto your Chromebooks and just like write down the answers as you go on a piece of paper. And then I'll get you that packet tomorrow. It won't be due until, I think, Wednesday. So but, we are doing a packet then? Yeah, well, it, no, it's not a guided notes, though. Oh. This is a different packet. Oh. You've never seen this packet. OK, the mystery of heredity. So before the 20th century, no one really knew how heredity worked. We only had a couple of assumptions. We knew that it did occur within species because people were like, hey, they kind of look like your mom, your dad, you know, or with animals, they look like the parents. Um, traits are transmitted directly from parents to offspring. So they thought, yeah, there's definitely this transmission going on between parents, parents, parentals, whatever, offspring. Um, so as a result, a lot of people believe that traits were blended or they were fixed. However, there's this kind of paradox when you believe that uh, because no variation enters a species from the outside. If variation within a species blends in every generation, then all species should have the same appearance. But that was not the case. Humans, we don't all look the same. I mean, we have eyes and noses and mouths, as some of us do have eyes. But we have different characteristics and traits. <clears throat> Skip the slide. Nope, I didn't. OK. So I'm going to tell you the story, I guess, of how heredity came about. And it will kind of end with Gregor Mandel. But uh, Josef Kruger, 1760, uh, he started to produce hybrids, and he saw some puzzling results. So he was messing around with tobacco, and he, when he cross-fertilized different strands of tobacco, the offspring were fertile. Okay, and so that means that they cooked. I mean, like, how is this possible? How can I take two different species and then get a new strand of tobacco? So the offsprings differed from both parent strands in this case. Individuals within hybrid generations were then crossed, and then he noticed that, hey, some of these look like the hybrid, but some of them went back to the grandparents. What's going on here? So it kind of contradicted this theory of direct transmission, because now we have something that looks like <coughs> the grandparents instead of the parents. Uh, in 1823, Knight crossed two varieties of pea garden plants, and um, so this may sound like Gregor Mendel, Okay, so Gregor Mendel was um, kind of before this. So true bred uh, breed green seeds and true bred yellow seeds. He crossed them together. All offspring were yellow seeds. Then the offsprings were crossed together, um, and some were yellow, some were green. So Knight was responsible for this this coined term character or traits, and that each uh, character was segregated. So this idea of um, there's, there, there might be two alleles or two traits. So here he is thinking, hmm, first generation is all yellow, second ge you know, generation is yellow with some green, shrugged his shoulders, didn't really do anything with it, and just left it at that. But Gregor Mendel is literally considered the father of heredity. Um, 
because he applied some math to it and he could explain what was going on here. So a little story about Gregor Mendel. Um, Gregor Mendel, yes, he was an Austrian monk, but he actually wanted to be a teacher. However, he suffered from anxiety, like, like high anxiety. And so when it came time to take the exams or tests to become a teacher, he never passed them because of his anxiety. Okay. Oh, sorry. Hello, Elgin. Oh, I've been standing okay. there. I was, I was interested. Um, hold on. But anyway, that's a good point. Sure. I'm not sure we never did that. Did we take video? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. I just was concerned with the window of the office. That's fine. <clears throat> uh, so instead of being a teacher, they're like, hey, why don't you be an Austrian monk? Live the peaceful life, right? So he's living the peaceful life, but he, you know, he's a man that kind of dabbled in everything. That's why he wanted to be a teacher, because that, you know, usually one teacher, a bunch of pupils, they caught all the subjects. So he dabbled in everything. Um, so he decided to take over the garden and kind of turn it into a scientific experiment. So he crossed pea plants and he counted all the outcomes. What color were they? Were they wrinkled? Were they round? The position of the flowers? Were they purple flowers? Were they white flowers? And he recorded it in notebooks and notebooks and notebooks and notebooks. And notebooks. And uh, came up, and he actually started to see a pattern, I should say, ratios. Um, however, when Gregor Mendel passed, you know, he didn't publish his works. So it wasn't until like 100 years later, it was before, maybe it was 40, I don't know, several years later, um, where we stumbled upon his works. And we're like, oh my gosh, this guy actually figured it out. Why didn't you publish it? You know, he was an Austrian monk, so it was just... So pea plants are small. They were the perfect model organism, easy to grow. They have a short generation time. You could get your results very quickly. Um, each plant has both the male and the female sex organs. And so you can control which plant crosses with which plants. Um, so we call them gametes are produced by male and female parts of the same flower. They fuse together to form the viable offspring so they can actually self-fertilize. Or you can cross-fertilize where you remove male parts of one and kind of dabble it into a female organ of another. So you can cross fertilize. So fertilize them, they can look the same. Fert fertilization just means the combination of sperm mm -hmm. and egg. So would they look the same as a, the same plant as the correct? Oh yes, they would they be. Would they would be clones. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, so Mendel's experimental design. What he did is he only focused on one trait. There's there were seven different traits he could have chose from, but he just focused on one. And so he conducted his, his, uh, his experiments into three stages. He allowed plants to self cross many generations to ensure plants were either purebred or true breeding, which means that they were 100% purple or 100% white or 100% green or 100% yellow or whatever. So there was no, I mean, like they were true purebred, they said, purebred. Uh, Mendel crossed purebred varieties, exhibiting alternative forms of the traits, and he re performed reciprocal process. So maybe he took a white flower and fertilized it with a purple flower, and he took a purple flower and fertilized it with a white flower. <clears throat> so he did it both ways, um, you know, to make sure that his results were, were valid and all that. Then the third step was that he permitted the hybrid offspring to self-fertilize for several generations, and he recorded everything quantitatively. He wrote everything down. So here we have self-fertilization to get the purebred. Then he crossed, fertilized, these two purebreds, and in the first generation, they were all purple. So then he allowed them to self-fertilize for many generations, and he started to see a ratio, this three-to-one ratio that we're going to talk about in a few weeks. Um, okay, so um, before I jump back to Gregor Mendel, I need to talk about some vocab terms here. Monohybrid crosses versus dihybrid crosses. So in a monohybrid cross, it's a cross that follows only two variations on a single trait. You're just looking at one trait, and then is it a dominant or a recessive allele? And so with the pea plants, there were seven different characteristics, and they're listed here. Height, so you could be tall, short, round, wrinkled, yellow, green. Uh, the, the seed coat color could be green or white. Pod shape, the pod color, the flower position. They, in this table here, they list all the dominant traits at the top and all the recessive traits at the bottom. And so what dominant and recessive means is you have the dominant allele, that's the trait that will be shown in the organism. And the only way you can be recessive is if you have the two recessive alleles. So two alleles are responsible for the trait. So with his F1 generation, which is, um, here's the parental, 100% purple, denoted by capital P, capital P. 
and then the white flour, 100% white, pure bread, little p, little p, you cross them together, and you get a big p, little p. Now, because big p stands for purple, that means all the offspring are purple. Then he let them self-pollinate each other, okay? And he saw a three-to-one ratio, where 75% ended up to be purple and 25% were white. So this F, we call this the F2 generation. He exhibited both um, traits from the, the parental generation, so it kind of went back to it. So any questions so far? I think I'm going to kind of go, um, I'm going to show you some of his actual data. So this is um, taken from, you know, Gregor Mendel's, these numbers are taken from his notebooks. And so he was looking at seed form, round versus wrinkle, and um, in the F1, 5,474 were round, 1,850 were wrinkled. And if you figured out the ratio, it's 2.96 to 1, so it's really close to 3 to 1, 3.0 to 1, 3.15 to 1. So they're really, really close to that 3 to 1 ratio. Could you imagine counting 5,474? Oh, yeah, so uh, I should also mention that he did suffer a little bit also from OCD. So very meticulous with his work. Now the 3 to 1 ratio is actually a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. We say three to one because on the physical appearance, three purple flowers to one white flower. But if we look at the alleles, the alleles show the one to two to one ratio, where 25% are big P, big P purple, purebred purple plants. 50% are hybrids, big P, little p. 25% are purebred for the recessive allele, in this case, white, little p little p. So you get the 1, the 2, the 1 ratio. Um, so maybe I should do some Punnett squares. I don't know. I'm sure this is all review, but I hope it is anyways. Is it? Yeah. What? It's a Punnett square. It's a Punnett square. Punnett square. Named after what's, Renegel what's C. What's the dichotomous theme? Dichotomous P. That's something. <laughs> I know that's something. Okay, dichotomous key is like, oh, you're looking at a leaf and you're trying to figure out the species. Are the leaves lobed or toothed? And then you go on to the next question. What are the oh, veins yeah, like? Yeah, and you yeah. just do these like yes or no questions. <laughs> okay, so in the first, this is the, the, par the parental cross. Big P, big P, 100% purple. Little P, little P, 100% white. And you fill it in 100% hybrid. Okay, big P, little P. So then in his second set, so this is this is all F1 generation, right there. So then in the second set, he took the hybrids and he crossed them. So big P, big P, big P, little P, big P, little P. So all of these three boxes right here are purple, 25% are white, but if you look at the genotype, the alleles, you get the one, the two, the one ratio. All right, some more observations. Um, so plants crossed did not produce intermediate appearance. There was no blending or mixing of traits. If you take purple and you mix it with white and paint, you get like a lighter purple color. That's not what happened here. It's either this or that. For each trait, one alternative was not expressed in the F1 hybrids, but it reappeared in the F2. And he noticed that it was always the recessive trait that disappeared in the F1, and then it reappeared in the F2. <clears throat> Pairs of alternative traits examined traits. Oops, I think I must have retyped that were segregated among progeny. So some exhibited one trait, some exhibited the other. And so this kind of ties into meiosis, how the chromosomes line up and they split. Um, and then you always saw this Mendelian ratio, where the dominant trait was always 3 to 1 in the F2 generation. 
So from Mendel's work, we can put together something called a five element model that ex kind of explains heredity in a nutshell. Parents do not transmit physiological traits directly to offspring. We transmit to them in discrete units called genes. So you inherit genes from your parents. Each individual receives two genes that encode each trait. So either dominant or recessive allele. So if you have dominant, dominant, you'll be homozygous dominant. You know, recessive, recessive, homozygous, recessive, or maybe, well, we'll talk about this on Thursday, but like, my husband has a widow's peak. That's a dominant trait. You guys know what a widow's peak is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like a vampire comes down to a little point. Okay, I don't have a widow's peak, but life does. Larissa has a widow's peak. Okay, so like, if I were to figure out my Punnett square for a widow's peak, I don't have it. So that means I'm little w, little w. My husband has it. I don't know what his second allele is. But if you were to have a kid who didn't, then you'd know he was w. Exactly. So when Erickson baby number two comes around, whenever that happens, I, you know, maybe I can find out. I know that's kind of one of the things I like. Oh, she's got, you know, hitchhiker's thumb or not. I don't know. Dimples. She's got dimples. Dimples are dominant. I don't have dimples. Life has dimples. But I know there's a 50% chance for sure that she would have a widow's peak, but I don't know what the other percent is. So you can be a detective. Okay. Not all copies of a gene are identical. There are alternative forms of the genes called alleles. So I know I've been saying the word allele, and you may not have known what that is. It's just an alternative form of a gene. Two copies of the same gene, big A, big A, or little a, little a. We call that homozygous homo prefix for same. If you are a hybrid, big A, little a, two different genes, we call you a heterozygous. The two alleles remain discrete. They do not blend. They do not alter each other. And then finally, the presence of a particular allele does not ensure that the trait will be expressed. So in a heterozygous, only one allele is expressed, and it's always that dominant allele. So recap, phenotype is the physical appearance of what it looks like. So in this case, I could say round versus wrinkled. But the genotype is looking at the letters. Your genotype codes for your phenotype, which is the physical appearance. Um, so here's a Punnett square just showing the hybrids being crossed. You get the 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So the genotype is a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio or a 3 to 1 ratio. Okay, the principle of segregation. So two alleles of a gene segregate during gamete formation, and they are rejoined at random um, from each parent during fertilization. So in meiosis, how those chromosomes line up, it's all random. Okay, and it happens in metaphase one of meiosis. So that's where Mendel's law of segregation comes into play. In metaphase one of meiosis, those homologous chromosomes lined up randomly. You don't know which side is on which of the metaphase plate when it splits. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, the Punnett square allows for the symbolic analysis of what's going on here to show the law of segregation. Okay, how, you know, here we have a parent that's pure red, or maybe, I don't know, I don't know what's going on. Pure red. Well, the gametes split, and then you can figure out the probability of what the offspring will be. Some comic strips. Oh man, we made a baby. Don't panic, don't panic. Baby. Hey, if we made two, we'd have a better than even chance of red hair. Soon. Ah, oh, crap. Hey, if we made three, soon. Wow, you suck at making punnet squares. So, two geneticists. Okay. 30% of biologists first states disintegrate and make into punnet squares. Both my parents were colorblind, so hey, if we made more than two, we'd have a better even chance of adorable red hair. Ooh. Check this, green eyes. No, I, I don't actually know. Okay, in human traits, it's a little bit different. There are some traits that are either or, okay? Um, and we'll look at those on Thursday, like widow's peak or no widow's peak, dimples, no dimples. But um, we actually have a lot of traits that don't follow this nice dominant recessive. So in humans, it's really hard to study. And you can't control your crosses in humans. That would just be unethical. 
We can use pedigrees to model the mode of inheritance of certain traits that we follow. And a pedigree is just this graphical um, representation of how things are passed on over multi-generations. And so here, we're looking at a trait that's filled in with black. I don't know, maybe we should... Um, this is an autosomal recessive. So if you are 100% filled in, we'll just say a little r, little r. And if you don't have it, then you for sure have a big R. And so from pedigrees, you can actually figure out what people's genotypes are for that trait. So I'm just going to go ahead and fill in the ones that are known. Wait, why did you know that the black ones are? Um, because if, if this was a W, like a, sorry, a capital R, well, then all of these should, there should be more offspring that are filled in, but that's not the case. That white one should be a big R, little R. <laughs> not necessarily. This one? Yeah. No. Yeah, because when that one white one made it with the black one, we got a black one. This one? Yeah. But, oh, let me explain how pedigrees work. So this shows marriage. This shows the offspring. They have three kids. So they didn't have that other black This son one. married a girl. No, I know. But I'm saying if that guy was big R, big R, and that person was little R, little R, there's no way they could have Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yes. Oh, I thought you were talking about this one. Yeah, so there's a pretty good chance that this person was 100% homozygous, big R, big R. Um, so then you can go in and fill this. But that can't be the case. No, though. I was saying the other way. He'd be a big R, a little R. Yeah. My bad. Okay, so we all know that they have big R's. And then if you look at, they married outside. So this person received one little R. Hmm, where did they get the other little R? From their dad. So then it goes back to saying, hey. Let's look on this side. Okay. So here we have one, two, three kids and a son that is little r, little r. Well, if he got one little r from mom, that means that the other little r came from dad. So you always get one allele from each of your parents. So dad is a square? Yep. So dad is, yes, males are square. You guys are really good at math. Square. <laughs> So, big R, little r, little r, little r, you know, fill this in, that's easy. Um, this for sure, obviously, is a big R, but you don't know what the second allele is unless you take a look at how these two are married. Well, here we have a little r, little r, white one. Right, so that means they have to have. So you get to play, like, detective with pedigrees, trying to figure out who's got what. It's impossible to tell sometimes. This one for sure has to be a character. You can only get a little R from mom. But, yeah, that's a pedigree. Okay. So monohybrids, just looking at one trait. Dihybrid crosses look at two traits in a single cross. So maybe you want to look at round, what color? Or, sorry, round versus wrinkled, or yellow and green. So you're looking at two traits at the same time. So you have to set up a very massive Punnett square. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's pretty big, okay? That's a big Punnett square. So like how you uh, figure out to set up your Punnett square, you take a look at one set of the parents. So you have big R, big R, um, big Y, big Y. So you take the first letter and you kind of foil it. So my first box will be big R, big Y, and then my second box will be big R, big Y. And then I take the second letter and I FOIL it, so big R, big Y, big R, big Y. So that, this is just for once, one parent. Then you look at second parent, and I'm going to write that over here. Take the first letter and you FOIL it. Little r, little y, little r, little y. Take the second letter, foil it. Now this is obviously an easy Punnett square because I should have wrote them into the square. Go me.
realize I'm doing that. Okay. There. So here's parent one. Here's parent two. And now you just go in and you fill it. So when you fill it, you always write the capital letter first. Big R followed by the little letter. Big Y, little y. Big R, little r, big Y, little y. If you were to do this, that is wrong. Okay, don't do that. And then I proceed to fill in, and they would all be 100% typewriter. Okay, now if I were to take the hybrid, so on the previous Punnett square, the big one, they were 100% this. So now I want to take them and cross fertilize them together. So big R, big Y, big R, little y. Can I do the same thing for this? <coughs> and then this is, oh, I did it again. Why did you guys stop me? <laughs> okay, this is where the fun begins. Filling that all in. <laughs> okay, so you filled it in. You're like, whoo, now this is the even more fun part. Trying to figure out what the heck this all means. Okay, so then you take a look at the traits. Okay, I got big R, big R, big Y, big Y. How many of those do I have? Oops, more ones. Big Y. One, right? Okay. Big R, big R, big Y, little Y. How many do I have? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, sorry. One, two. I meant to say one, two. I don't know what I was saying. There should be a third one, though, right? No. Let me go one, three, three. You can also be big R, little r, big Y, big Y. You can also be big R, little r, big Y, little Y. These are all round and yellow. And then just four. So one, two. These are all round and yellow. Okay. Let's go big R, big R, little y, little y. One. One? Right. Mm -hmm. And then, let's see, big R, little r, little y, little y. Two. Is that all for my round? So these are round and yellow, or uh, green. Okay, little r, little r, big y, big y. That's one. Little r, little r, big y, little y. Two. And then water. So this is all round, or um, this is round. Oh, 
Yeah. So that was a concert. Yeah. So so you were thinking of no, it's yellow. Yes, yellow. yellow. Oh, and then the last one is wrinkled and green, which is the other one. Whew. So then if you count up the round and yellow, nine, round and green, wrinkled and yellow, and then wrinkled and green, there's your nine to three to three. That's just for the big on the uh, big by little white cross. Yeah, so this is how they get to 9 to 3 to 3 on their sheet. Whew. This would be F2 generation then. Yes. You'd be crossing F2. Before. Yep. Oh, this is taking long enough. Okay, so not only do we have the law of segregation, but we also have independent assortment. The alleles of two genes appear to behave independently of, the, of, of each other. In hybrid crosses, the alleles of each gene assort independently, so they're not like linked to each other. They, again, line up randomly. The, the alleles are separate. They're their own entity, basically. So the presence of an allele of one of the genes in a gamete has no influence over another allele of another gene that is present. That's a lot. Okay, so for this Mendel packet, say hello to Greg Mendel. You know what's funny? I can hear that now. I get it. <coughs> oh, dear. I can't hear my question. I'm just like, yeah, you. Okay, so for this Mendel packet, um, you have to read a little bit, and then you answer some questions, and it goes into some multiple choice review. And then there's some vocab, make sure you understand the difference between allele and genes and homozygotes and heterozygotes. And then there's a Punnett square, so you just do like a simple four window Punnett square. And then you move on, and the last two are the Y hybrid crosses, or the big Punnett squares. All right. So the rest of the time is yours to work on this. I, it's, I would consider it homework. Bring your questions tomorrow if you struggle. I'm sure Herman Norcross will struggle. Since they probably didn't see me do that die hybrid cross because it's not on the lecture. So, so sorry guys.